Hey there. Uh, this is a video that is the second part of a lesson on plants and the terrestrial environment. This is actually a three-part lesson. Uh, I will talk for a while about um, how uh, plants have adapted to different types of conditions within their environment. We'll take a break and watch a video on different types of photosynthesis made by someone else, a nice little animation. And then finally, um, the last part of this uh, lesson on the terrestrial environment will be about soils. And so I'll return and talk to you a little bit about that. So let's continue. We have been talking about how light and temperature vary according to latitude and according to time of year. And so uh, let's think about how uh, vegetation, how plants within these different environments uh, might have adapted to these variations in light and temperature from season to season. Uh, so we can see down here um, in uh, uh, in the bottom right is uh, a place essentially with four different seasons. So this is essentially what is being experienced in South Jersey and what we might expect to see of many, but not all, many of the trees in our area. And so these are uh, what are called deciduous trees. Um, deciduous means like falling down. And so these trees lose their leaves. Um, and so this is a process called abscission. Um, the plant actually has a series of hormones that regulate this process and are um, essentially expressed or not expressed based on how much light is sensed by the plant. Um, so kind of a wild system, really interesting. Um, the, the hormone, the main hormone that controls this process is called auxin or a series of hormones called auxins. Um, and they essentially keep um, what is called the petiole, so this little leaf stalk, attached to the branches as long as there is enough light. Um, essentially the stem keeps the leaf alive. Um, however, due to a shift in weather, um, the auxins are reduced and what is formed, if we zoom into this joint right here between the petiole or leaf stalk and the stem of the plant, is that a layer of cells is programmed to die. Um, so when these die, uh, these cells die, less, uh, you know, less resources are diverted to and from the leaf. And so the leaf um, slowly dies off. Um, and of course the leaf then falls to the forest floor. Um, this does a lot of things for the terrestrial environment. Um, first of all, as these leaves, um, as they fall off, they are going to generate a layer of debris, a, a layer of leaves on the ground. And so um, this detritus, this dead material, um, actually acts as an insulating blanket for other organisms on the ground. And so again, we're talking about um, not just, um, you know, not just the organisms, but uh, the entire environment. And so the plants help to provide this buffering layer for the colder months of the winter. Um, furthermore, by losing the leaves, essentially during the winter, even more light is able to get to the forest floor and therefore um, warm up um, the environment in that area. Um, so as we can see, uh, this adaptation by plants, uh, you know, losing the leaves in the winter, growing them back in the spring, um, this is actually significantly affecting the environment um, in this area. And so uh, there's kind of, well, th there are many different strategies. Um, I want to compare two different strategies that plants have um, and think about the benefits for the plants to um, to actually use these different strategies and in turn, what does it mean for the terrestrial environment um, if it is dominated by plants that follow either of these strategies. And so what we see here is what is called a biome map. Um, you probably uh, learned about different biomes in your high school biology class or maybe even in um, your bio two or B&E class. Um, and so I just, uh, I'm not going to walk through each and every one of these different biomes, but what I am going to do again is compare two different biomes. And so what we're going to look at are um, the deciduous temperate uh, forests. So this is what we experience here uh, in South Jersey um, compared to the boreal forest. Okay, so um, two different strategies. One, of course, is closer to the pole, so it's a lot colder. Um, a lot drier even, um, versus the deciduous forest that we experience here, um, a lot wetter, a lot warmer, and um, you know, still experiencing seasons. 
Okay, so this is two generic images of the boreal forest, of course, dominated by evergreens. Um, these coniferous trees hold their leaves for the entire year despite the fact that most of the year is uh, very cold and very dark. Um, and deciduous forests, which is what we, um, again, what we live in in South Jersey. Of course, we have coniferous trees, but um, the forest is dominated by deciduous trees. And so let's first think about uh, what is the benefit to losing leaves in the first place? Well, um, you might imagine that it is easier for the plant to not have to maintain those tissues all winter long. Um, so as uh, as the temperatures drop, the water within the leaves freezes and it can damage the tissues. Um, it makes the tree um, essentially um, you know, catch the wind a lot more and so it's a lot more stress on the branches. Um, and so if the tree drops the leaves in the winter, it's a lot easier maybe to survive through the winter than um, it otherwise would be if they kept the leaves on. Uh, and so that is the strategy employed by these deciduous trees. Um, so that seems like a great idea, a great strategy. So what would be the benefit of retaining those leaves all year long, right? So what would be experienced here in the boreal forest? Uh, well, remember that in the boreal forest, uh, essentially the summer is really short. It's really cold for most of the time and they're experiencing, or they're receiving very little solar radiation. And so if these trees were to drop their leaves, by the time it warmed up enough in the springtime uh, for them to start photosynthesizing again, they would have to go through the process of using tons of resources to grow those leaves back. And so they would be um, essentially uh, wasting some of that time that they could be using photosynthesizing with the very limited sun that they have. And so if these trees keep their leaves all year long, they're able to photosynthesize sooner. They're able to um, take advantage of every sunny day they possibly can. Uh, furthermore, uh, for the most part, these environments um, are much less productive than an environment like this, and so lim resources are even more limited. And so um, by maintaining um, actually half of the leaves, they do le lose about half of their needles every year, so it's not the same needles um, that are like decades old. Instead, they replace some of their leaves all the time, um, but by, by keeping many of the leaves, they are saving a lot of resources um, that it would take uh, to grow back every single one of their leaves. Okay. Um, so snow load and wind, right? So as I said, uh, keeping your leaves all year long um, essentially makes you, or makes the tree uh, very vulnerable to wind. It's a lot more stress on those branches. And of course, if you live in an area that gets a lot of snow, such as the boreal forest here, um, the leaves catch the snow and they make that snow load a lot heavier. Okay. Um, so um, what's the deal here? You, again, you would think, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense for a boreal forest, which of course gets a lot of snow, um, to be dominated by these evergreens. Uh, and so the difference here between these deciduous trees and these evergreens, these coniferous trees, is the shape of the leaf. So instead of having these really broad leaves that would otherwise catch snow and catch wind, um, these trees have needle-shaped leaves. And so the snow uh, actually slides right off and for the most part, it slides right off. Um, the wind is able to pass through those needles. Um, and um, furthermore, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, the structure of the needle is designed in such a way um, that it has a really thick cuticle, a really thick covering on the outside. It keeps moisture in, kind of insulates the leaf, um, and you know maybe uh, prevents freezing and whatnot as well. Um, so two different strategies, uh, both very much suited for the climate in these different areas. Temperature and photosynthesis. Um, so I mentioned a couple times at this point that um, the 
uh, evergreen trees, the coniferous trees that we've been talking about, um, want to maximize the time that they are able to photosynthesize. And that's why they keep, or one of the many reasons why they keep their leaves all year round. Um, and so the idea here is that um, photosynthesis cannot happen at all temperatures. As we discussed in a previous lesson, there are a series of enzymes that are required um, to actually complete the process, one of which is Rubisco. We talked about this as a limiting, um, a limiting enzyme uh, that, uh, you know, essentially determines the maximum rate at which a plant can photosynthesize. Now, another detail about this enzyme is that it happens to only be active within a relatively narrow temperature range. Okay, uh, so as we can see up here, uh, this is. Um, you know, on the x-axis temperature, so here is freezing, here is warmer, um, and net photosynthesis as determined by the activity of Rubisco. Um, so that enzyme that is catalyzing a major limiting step within the photosynthesis process. Um, so uh, what we can see is below freezing, very little, if any, photosynthesis is able to occur. Right? This enzyme is just not active when it's really cold. Um, and we can see that as the um, temperature increases, 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 um, the rate of Rubisco and therefore photosynthesis activity is going to decline as well. Um, so essentially, uh, this, uh, this graph is showing us a zone of tolerance, uh, more or less, um, for temperatures um, in terms of photosynthetic potential. There is an optimal temperature for photosynthesis, which is give or take 21 degrees Celsius. And so uh, there is um, a need, therefore, of the plant to essentially manipulate the environment to maintain these optimal photosynthetic conditions as much as physically possible. Um, of course, um, there are a lot of different ways that this can happen. We are going to talk about some of them here. Um, first of all, um, the plant can manipulate the light, right? So it can, um, you know, the plant can grow taller to kind of outcompete and get to the light, um, despite, uh, you know, despite other competing plants around it. Um, also, it can change things like convection, right? So it can change the temperature of the leaf. Um, and finally, transpiration. So how much water is being lost from the leaf, how much heat is being held in the leaf, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, and so uh, not only do plants have a particular shape of a leaf, but they're also able to move their leaves in some cases. And we talked about that a little bit before. Um, some of them can have like a steeper angle or um, kind of flatten the leaves out to catch more or less sunlight um, or, you know, allow more and more heat to be um, to be lost from the leaf. Um, sometimes they can roll up, sometimes they can, you know, flatten out. Um, sometimes they grow like different, like little hairs to reflect the heat. Uh, so a lot of different things are happening within the leaf. Um, this image down here shows just some of the different um, physical uh, processes occurring. All right, so solar radiation, some is absorbed, some is reflected, um, some heat is lost via evapotranspiration, so heat loss from the leaf. Um, some infrared radiation is absorbed by the water, mostly it is reflected um, by the pigments of the plant. Um, and of course, heat can be conducted throughout the plant or um, kind of uh, reflected off as well. So uh, let's first start by talking about heat loss through convection. Um, so as with anything, heat is, um, heat is lost into the local environment, but not equally, not all the time. Um, so what we can see here in this image is that heat is um, dissipating from the leaf, right? And this is heat that's been absorbed by, um, you know, the leaf absorbing solar radiation. Um, and so heat is going to dissipate into this boundary layer, this little layer um, of air surrounding the leaf. Okay. Um, heat loss, right, the dissipation of heat from the leaf is going to change depending on a few conditions. Um, first of all, um, if the air outside the leaf is much colder than the leaf itself, then heat loss is going to occur much faster. On the other hand, if the leaf is about as hot as it is in the outside air, 
heat loss is going to happen very slowly. And so this just gets back to the concept of gradients, right? The steeper the gradient, the faster diffusion essentially is going to take place. Okay, so here we can see um, a, well, yeah, so here um, a thick boundary layer and here a thin boundary layer. Um, wind turbulence is also going to accelerate heat loss uh, for better or worse. So if there is a lot of wind, right, nice and breezy, essentially um, the local environment around the leaf, the boundary layer, um, is going to be um, kind of blown away really quickly. Okay, and so what that's going to do is it's going to keep the gradient of temperature much steeper and therefore um, dissipation of heat is going to happen pretty quickly, right? So wind turbulence, right? This disturbance of the boundary layer blowing away um, the air filled with heat, filled with moisture, whatever, um, in the local environment of the leaf keeps on blowing it away. And so that accelerates the loss of heat and as we're going to see moisture as well from the leaf. Uh, furthermore, the size of the leaf determines how quickly heat is going to be lost from the leaf. Um, in this image from your textbook, we can see uh, two different leaves, and there's a couple of variables that we can explore here, but the first one I want to point out is the size of the leaf. So here we have a little oak leaf, here we have a much larger sycamore leaf, and um, in this temperature gradient, what we can see is at the boundary between the leaf and the air, it's cooler than in the leaf itself, right? So essentially increasing surface area, increasing this boundary space between the leaf and the outside air increases heat loss. Okay, so um, uh, this graph down here is showing us the edges of the sycamore leaf are cooler, the middle of the sycamore leaf is hotter, and then the other edge is cooler as well. Okay, um, and so we can see that in the sycamore leaf, um, here and here, that the inside of the leaf remains much hotter than the oak leaf, um, A, because of uh, the size of the leaf, right? Surface area to volume ratio is different here than it is here, and so the inside of the leaf is farther away from the edge where it is cooler. Therefore, the inside of the leaf stays much warmer than it does um, in a smaller leaf. Um, B, the second factor that's um, different between the sycamore and the oak leaf is um, the depth and abundance of what are called lobes. So these little lobes right here, um, the oak leaf has a lot more and relative to the size, these lobes are much deeper. And so what that's essentially doing is it's bringing more air closer to the inside of the leaf, therefore creating a larger interface with the outside world and uh, providing more of an opportunity for heat to dissipate. Okay, so um, depending on the needs of the plant, depending on the environment in which it has evolved, um, this leaf might be more adapted to an area that needs to maintain heat in the leaf, this leaf here might be more adapted to an area that needs to get rid of a lot of heat from the leaf. Okay. And so uh, larger leaves maintain heat, smaller leaves release heat a lot more quickly. And so you might be questioning at this point, well, why are leaves in the tropics so big? Right, these really warm areas. Um, why are banana leaves, why are palm leaves so big if they're living in really warm environments and the leaves can't get too hot or else they can't photosynthesize anymore? So what is the deal there? Well, uh, yes, these tropical leaves are huge, right? But what we might also notice is that all of these leaves have a lot of different segments, right? So there are holes in the middle, there are really deep lobes, lobes, sorry, um, or there are little leaflets, right? So um, even though the leaf itself is huge, there's actually a lot of surface area that is interacting with the outside world. Uh, and so a study, uh, a study in the 70s was done um, by Taylor um, in which, um, they studied uh, banana leaves that um, essentially had not torn 
right? So like whole banana leaves um, versus leaves that had these really deep tears, which looks like damage to the leaf. But what they found out was that um, the leaves that did not tear, right, did not have these little, um, you know, what looks like damage to it, um, they actually didn't survive, right? They actually got crispy, died, fell off. Um, but the banana leaves that had all of these tears on them, they were able to survive um, for months or years to come. Okay. Uh, so uh, take home message here is that lobes or segmentation or tears or even um, these leaves like with holes, this isn't an insect that's eaten this, like this is how the leaf grows. Um, essentially, um, this increases the surface area available um, or interfacing with the outside world. Um, also, as wind blows over these leaves, it increases the turbulence of the air, therefore whisking away that, um, you know, that boundary layer air from around the leaf, therefore keeping that gradient steep and allowing more heat dissipation to occur. Okay, it's a kind of cool strategy there. Um, more temperate leaves, right? So this is an oak leaf, right? This, um, there, are, you know, there's a difference between these two, of course. Um, this has a nice smooth margin. This, of course, very deep lobes, right? Lots of lobes. And so um, this leaf is small, right? Allowing a lot of heat dissipation because it is a small leaf. This leaf here, um, again, has these nice deep lobes and therefore, um, yeah, so nice deep lobes, again, increasing the surface area uh, for heat dissipation. Uh, and so uh, going back to these uh, pine needles, um, looks like there is a ton of surface area, right? So you might think, huh, maybe this is a plant that is adapted to live in a really hot environment. This is essentially an extreme example of this kind of a tropical leaf right here. Um, and so this might seem a little bit counterintuitive. Um, however, um, these plants, um, we know um, coniferous trees, they are adapted for colder climates. They keep their leaves all year round um, to maximize photosynthesizing potential. Like why aren't they losing a ton of heat and therefore reducing their ability to photosynthesize? Well, what's going on here is that for the most part, these needles are closely packed together, right? So if you've ever looked at a pine, um, like a pine tree and look at the leaves really closely, you'll see that they're actually in bundles. Um, the main pine tree around here is in bundles of three. And so those leaves are really closely packed together, um, keeping a uh, kind of a micro environment in between the needles to reduce, um, reduce heat loss. Okay. Um, so you can kind of think about like penguins, right? So penguins in Antarctica, they pack themselves really closely together to keep the heat between them and to keep that from dissipating out into the world. And so um, coniferous trees are using somewhat of a similar strategy. Water loss. Okay, so plants have to have a strategy to manipulate light and convection, therefore heat loss. Um, they also need to have a strategy to manipulate transpiration or essentially evaporation from a plant. Um, and so this is probably a review for you, but um, just very basically, um, if we look at a section through a plant leaf, here is the part that's exposed to the sun. So the top of the leaf, here is the bottom of the leaf. And as we know, photosynthesis happens within these cells here. Um, on, um, on the surface of the leaf, there are specialized cells called guard cells, um, which essentially can open or close these little pores called a stoma for singular, stomata for plural. Um, this is what it looks like under the microscope. Um, and so the plant can actually close these little pores and open these little pores based on the, le the needs of the plant at the time. And so um, the plant, when it opens these leaves, it can do a couple different things. Um, first of all, it can essentially inhale carbon dioxide, right? So it can take in carbon dioxide and therefore allow photosynthesis to proceed. Really important, we'll come back to that. Um, also, when these stomata are open, transpiration can occur. So as long as they're open, water is able to leave, 
and carbon dioxide is able to enter. Right? You can't have one passing without the other as long as these pores, these stomata are open, you're going to lose water, but you're going to gain CO2. Uh, and so um, as these pores are open, um, evaporation or transpiration occurs into the local environment, this little micro environment in the boundary layer. Um, and of course, uh, water is going to evaporate or transpire more quickly if the gradient is steeper. So um, what this image down here is showing us is here's a leaf and here's a leaf. Um, in this leaf, the boundary layer is filled with a lot of moisture. So it's very humid in the boundary layer around the leaf. Um, in this leaf, the boundary layer is not very humid. And this can be because the air is moving. Right? That moisture is constantly being whisked away. It can be because this leaf is in the desert, right? really dry air. Um, and so either way, if there is less moisture in the boundary layer, right, in the microenvironment around the leaf, water loss is going to occur much more quickly as soon as these cells, um, as soon as these guard cells open up the stomata. Okay, so a plant can actually manipulate the boundary layer to an extent to increase or decrease how much water is able to be lost through those pores. Okay. Um, so uh, here, uh, this is a redwood tree in California. Um, in California, it's really hot, right? So really hot during the summer. Um, and so when these redwood trees open up those stomata, right, open up the stomata, what happens is transpiration, of course, is increased. Um, and so water is going to be lost through those pores. Um, where's the water coming from? Right, like uh, there's only so much water that is stored in leaves. So where exactly is that water coming from that is lost through the pores? Okay, um, and of course, where's the water coming from that assists with photosynthesis? Okay, uh, so um, as we know, water evaporates from the stomata way up here in the leaves. Okay, um, essentially leaving uh, a lower pressure, like lower water pressure or water potential within that leaf. Right, water is gone, so less pressure, less water within the leaf. Okay, um, so we'll take a look at this image right here. Right, stomata open, water leaves through those stomata. Right, transpiration through the stomata, um, leaving what is called again a negative water potential up here in the leaf, like less water up here, less water in the leaf than there is farther down in the trunk, and so. Um, Essentially, the water pressure down here in the trunk within the xylem, right? So within essentially these like little straws within the trunk um, and within the uh, vascular bundles of the leaves, um, these little straws um, have a higher water pressure than there is in the leaf. And so again, this is you know a story of something in this case water going from high pressure to low pressure. And so the water in the trunk is going to be essentially sucked up just like a straw farther up to the leaf. Okay, so the xylem acting like a straw. Um, ultimately, um, the water from the trunk is coming from the roots. Right? We'll talk a little bit more about soil here um, in our next video. Um, water is drawn up through the roots, through the root hairs, into the xylem of the roots, and finally up through the stem, through the xylem, and out to the leaves. So as long as there's enough water down here in the soil, um, essentially water will be replaced as quickly as it is evaporated. So what happens if there isn't enough water to pull up from the roots? Right, so maybe in an environment like this in uh, Sedona, Arizona, um, the sun is really hot, the air is really dry. As we know, that means that, um, you know, essentially the environment around the leaf is going to be really like much drier than inside the leaf, really steep gradient, and therefore a lot of water loss through those stomata as long as they are open. Um, and of course, um, the sun being so hot 
the leaf being so hot, this is also going to increase the rate of evaporation. Um, and so it would, um, it might make sense, right, for this plant to close its stomata to prevent any further water loss, right? There's only so much water in the soil, and so we don't want to lose a ton of water via transpiration. And so a, an option could be closing those stomata and therefore reducing the loss of water. The cost of that, right, the cost of closing the stomata is that there's not enough carbon dioxide to complete photosynthesis, right? So here would be a plant living in a very sunny environment, lots of opportunity for photosynthesis, but another limiting resource here, carbon dioxide. Okay, so plenty of sun, but not enough carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. The perk is that the plant retains water. The downside is that it can't complete photosynthesis after all. Right, so um, stomata being open or closed is a trade-off, particularly in environments that are very hot and very dry. And so how does the plant prevent drying out? How does the plant prevent desiccation or water loss? Um, well, there are um, actually a lot of different strategies, and we'll talk about some of them here. Um, first of all, some plants um, have a thick, waxy cuticle. Right, so most leaves have a cuticle in general, but um, many, if they are trying to prevent desiccation, have a thicker and thicker waxy cuticle to prevent water loss um, anywhere except for the stomata. Okay, so um, preventing water loss only in preventing water loss um, unless the plant has decided essentially that it's worth losing a little bit of water to take in enough carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, another, uh, another strategy, another adaptation to prevent or at least reduce desiccation or drying out like this up here is the placement of the stomata. Now, some leaves have stomata everywhere, right, if it's a really humid environment, but the drier their environment, the more um, important it is to place the stomata very intentionally. So what we can see here is that the stomata um, are on the bottom of the leaf. The bottom of the leaf is a lot more shaded, okay? Um, and uh, as a result, um, well, yeah, so it's a lot more shaded, and the relative humidity underneath the leaf is a lot higher than it is on the top of the leaf. And so what this means is that the gradient, the moisture gradient between the leaf and the surrounding air isn't quite as steep, and so water loss won't occur quite as quickly on um, from the stomata on the bottom of the leaf as opposed to on the top of the leaf. Um, all right, next, uh, plants can open their stomata um, selectively, of course, so only at certain times when it makes the most sense. Um, many plants close their stomata during the highest light intensity of the day. Uh, and so these are the ones that are most acclimate or most adapted to living in a really dry environment. Uh, what we see in this graph here is the day, right? So midnight, noon, and then midnight. Um, we see a stomatal opening here. Um, and um, in the beginning of the day, they're closed. There's no reason to lose any water if there's no light to actually photosynthesize. Um, as the sun rises, you see more and more stomata open up, right? And so again, opening stomata means carbon dioxide. It means photosynthesis. Um, at the most intense, the hottest, the brightest part of the day, the most stomata are open to make sure that the most photosynthesis can occur. And again, as light is lost, sun is setting, the stomata start to close. Okay, and so that is okay if there is a lot of moisture in the air, if there is not such a steep gradient between the leaf and the outside world. Um, plants that live in an arid, or really dry environment, actually close their stomata at the most intense period of the day to prevent further water loss. Okay. Um, finally, if transpiration from the leaves is greater than water from the roots, 
Okay. Naturally, right, without any kind of like active process or anything, naturally, um, there will be, uh, well, first of all, uh, the plant cells become flaccid, right? First, this actually closes the guard cells, right? So the cells around the stomata. And so before anything, these stomata close up. Um, and if this imbalance continues for any length of time, what will happen is all of the cells begin to become flaccid and the plant begins to wilt. Right? Obviously, this is a very water-stressed plant. Plants who live in an arid environment um, must have some extreme uh, adaptations to live in this incredibly inhospitable environment. And so certain plants are called xerophytes, so fight for plant zero for like none, so virtually no water, but still these plants survive. And so um, you can think of a cactus, you can think of some, you know, different types of grasses. Uh, these plants, again, can live in a very arid environment, but to do so, they need to be very strategic about it. Okay, um, so, uh, these plants are generally adapted to have um, optimal water uptake from the roots. And there's two different strategies that are used. Um, uh, for example, the swarrow here. So think of like the cactus, right? That like, when you think of a cactus, you're th probably thinking of a swarrow. Um, so these plants can be huge, right? Like 20 feet tall. And um, if you dig down into the soil, you'll see that the roots only go a couple inches deep into the ground. And so um, instead of going deep, right, the water table is really low in these deserts. So instead of going deep, these plants branch out with their roots. And so um, anytime it monsoons, right, every single afternoon, it's going to have a monsoon storm in the summertime. And so those monsoon rains pour down upon the ground percolates into the soil a few inches, and every single drop of water possible is soaked up by that swarrow um, because just like that, the water is going to be gone. Right? It's going to evaporate. It's going to percolate down into the soil a lot more. Okay, so swarrows, right? the cactus that you think of, branch out with their roots to optimize water uptake um, by, you know, absorbing water from those monsoon rains. Okay. Different strategy, right? These grasses here, um, and a lot of other native grasses in the desert, um, these guys take the other option. Um, they have really long roots, right? So instead of branching out, they actually uh, grow all the way down to the water table, and they're able to um, kind of tap into that resource um, all the time. Okay. Um, in both, uh, in both plants, in both strategies the roots actually accumulate solutes. And so if you remember um, how osmosis works, right? Water follows salt, water follows the solute. And so if the roots are saltier than the surrounding soil, any water is going to be sucked into those roots and therefore feed the plant, okay? Furthermore, um, the leaves, are adapted to lose less water in a variety of ways. Um, first of all, they have a really thick cuticle, right? So virtually no water is lost from the leaf unless the stomata are open. Uh, pubescence, uh, this is, um, you know, some of these plants have tiny little hairs and essentially what that's doing is um, it is um, a, reflecting some of that light, right? So it's not quite so intense, um, keeping the plant a little bit cooler, um, but also they are maintaining a, um, a boundary layer that maintains a little bit of moisture. Okay, so um, if again, there is um, moisture in the boundary layer, in the immediate outside environment, the gradient between the leaf and the outside world will be not quite as steep, and therefore less transpiration is going to occur from the stomata. Okay, um, reduced leaf area. Okay, um, so reduced so much, in fact, that um, many of the leaves of these plants are reduced to spines. Okay, so um, 
these little spines here are actually the leaves of the plants. Um, and if you were to take a section through those spines, which of course serve a protective function, a right, very painful protective function, uh, but if you were to take a section through that leaf, what you would see is that uh, the stomata are sunken into these pits. Right? So this is where essentially the plant breathes, and yes, it does lose a lot of water, but it's losing water not into the really arid outside environment. Instead, it's losing water to inside this little tiny curled leaf. And so inside the spine, inside the leaf, it's going to be very humid, at least relative to the outside world, um, and therefore less water is lost through the leaf. Okay. okay, at this time, um, I want to um, let you guys watch a video about different strategies of photosynthesis. For the most part, um, photosynthesis happens, you know, during the day with a certain type of carbon. Um, but um, in plants that are adapted to live in extremely arid environments, um, photosynthesis is going to occur in a slightly different way. And so I'm going to stop this video now, make sure that you watch this next video, and then after the video is done, come on back and we'll talk about soils. Thanks guys, and see you soon.